Good morning. I'm John French, and welcome to Virtual Balticon. This panel is on the three laws of robotics. Um, as you may have learned when before you logged in, this meeting is being recorded. Um, there is a chat room down at the bottom of your page, and there is a Q&A uh, button. Um, feel free to ask questions. We will be getting to those questions at, at the, at, toward the end of the panel. And now uh, starting with the person on my virtual left, um, I would like to ask, ask the panelists to um, introduce themselves and if they have an, a, book, a book or two to display, go ahead and display it. Uh, Mariah, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I'm Mariah Crawford. I'm a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I'm a private investigator on the side and I have published a whole bunch of short stories. Um, I do some writing about writing also and that stuff's up on my website. Okay, Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Wittenberg. I'm not a professional writer. I'm just a fan of the 20 plus years standing, uh, attending Balticon for about eight years now. Uh, I first encountered the three laws when I was in high school and there was a used book fair and someone said, hey, you're into that science fiction stuff. Here's a book by that Asimov guy. And I bought iRobot for about a buck. Hey, Andrew. Hello, my name is Andrew Love. I'm a, um, primarily a fan, although I recently had a short story published by Daily Science Fiction, so I'm at least dabbling in, uh, in writing. I do have one book to wave that's a uh, book by my wife. Uh, let me see if I can bring that up. Okay. Here it is. Uh, if you're interested in uh, flying horses by any, uh, by any chance, uh, take a look at uh, The Pegasus Potential, which is a, um, a um, YA fantasy about flying horses. Okay, who doesn't who doesn't like who doesn't like flying horses? Anyone, um, who's, all right. anyone who's underneath them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, carry an umbrella. Uh, Keith. My name is Keith Hughes. Uh, I'm a science fiction author. I have this series, Time Hunt, that is a time travel uh, series that I have out there. Um, I got into Asimov in high school. I was reading science fiction, and I and I lost on to Asimov. So I was reading all uh, all the robot novels, I Robot, and, and Foundation trilogy, and that was like my main thing. So I've been steeped in the uh, Three Laws for quite a number of years. Okay. And as I said, I'm John L. French. I'm a uh, retired crime scene investigator with the Baltimore City Police Department. I've been retired for about a year year and a few months now. I'm also an editor and a writer. Um, one of my most current books is The Magic of Simon Toombs. Simon is a gentleman adventurer with a flair for magic and a demon assistant. Um, most current book is The Siena Heist. Um, st short stories about Christmas written with uh, written by me and Patrick Thomas. So uh, let's get right into the three laws. First of all, what is a robot? Uh, Mariah. Oh, well, anything that, um, you know, the thing is, we, we were talking about this earlier, the, the word has not been used consistently. Uh, I think somebody here discovered that the law, the, the word was invented in the 20s, first used in the 1920s. I actually have to specify 19 now, don't I? Um, <laughs> I think that when most people hear the word robot, they envision like the walking, um, hopefully house cleaning, that's what I'm hoping for, um, uh, very humanish um, shaped cr creature, but then also we have, you know, the Roomba is clearly a robot and there are actually a tremendous number of robots being used in factories today that don't look anything like a person. Yeah. We actually named our, ro our Roomba Rosie. Okay. Excellent. Oh yes, Bull the Jetsons. <laughs> yes, so Jetsons. that you can be disappointed anew every day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Keith, anything to add? Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I do feel like there is a bit of a demarcation line between a robot and android, specifically in how human it, it looks. Um, you know, a, a robot, you know, to Mariah's point, doesn't have to look human. An android, what does? 
I don't think you can really have an Android that isn't trying at some level to, to be uh, simulating, or at least maybe I'll just say an organic being, because we've got some, we've got some that are also trying to simulate, you know, dogs and horses and things. So, so C3PO is Android, R2D2 is robot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Keith, since you're the one who discovered it, how old is the term Android? The term Android, quite surprisingly, goes clear back to 1728 which wow. shocked me when, when I discovered that. Um, it was used um, in uh, a document that St. Albertus Magnus uh, allegedly created. So, and there is actual um, documentation of the term being used as far back as 1795 even. Uh, so it's, it's been around a long time, which was actually quite surprising to me. So androids are older than robots. Yes. I'm going to um, add to that, though. I think that um, on Star Wars, droids was not used to mean just human-shaped robots. Um, they um, were clearly also referring to R2-D2 when they said droids. Yeah, they, that was, they, they, he turned that into kind of a... A, 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 a catch-all. Yeah, exactly. A cooler sound. The, the little floaty thing that tries to torture Lay is also a droid. Yeah. yeah. Well, the probe droid, you know, that was, you know... Yeah. By our definition, just now that would be considered a robot, but it was still called the Imperial Probe Yard. Um, Andrew, Alex, either one of you want to add to the definition? Well, I'm just going to note. I'm looking at looking at the comments from the back of my eye, and I'm seeing our our audience uh, is ahead of me because we have people noting the origin of the term robot coming from uh, Czech, meaning forced labor, mm -hmm. because in that play, it's there. There, it's the play. Uh, Rossum's Universal Robots is really just, um, it's actually about workers versus um, the, the system to some degree. So initially it's just the idea of robot is a worker. Uh, and I think for a long time, that's how robots were thought of in books. It's like, I guess it's appropriate to name your Roomba Rosie because Rosie the robot, most of the time was the thing that did the housework, except for that one episode where she fell in love with another robot. Right. God, I know too much. <laughs> uh, Andrew, I, I I don't think I have anything to add to what we would what we were have already said. Okay. Um. All right. So um, let's get to the big question: Who wants to tackle the three laws of robotics? Or is that a moderator's job? Let me let me point out that I posted a link to the three laws all the way at the top of the chat. Hopefully, people can still see them. But, the Wikipedia article. So if you're not yeah. familiar with the actually four laws of robotics, um, pop over right. there and take a look. I have them up if you want me to read them. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so the first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey the orders given to it by a human being except for such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And then later on, uh, he introduced the Zeroth Law, uh, which says a robot may not harm humanity or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. And even after that, there's a negative first law, which is a robot may not harm sentience, uh, mm -hmm. meaning alien intelligence or even robot intelligence. Okay. I've, I've, I've provided a link to the XKCD that looks at the uh, possibilities of the different orderings of the laws of robotics. What if you have uh, the duty to obey above the, above the restriction against killing and so on? Bad things tend to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I, one, of the, one of the implications of the zero law is, or the zero law is if a robot comes to believe a human might harm humanity, that robot is then free to harm or kill a human. Yes. Yeah. Like we saw with the movie I, Robot, where, where Vicky was working for the greater good, as she saw it. Um, but, you know, she was injuring individual humans to get that done. Yeah. Okay, which leads us into um, a topic. Did Asimov always obey his own laws? Actually, I, I have a good example of that. I recently uh, reread um, The Caves of Steel, and 
in the Caves of Steel, one of the, um, the spacers is talking about spacer society and describes how they will evaluate children to see whether they're growing up healthy and, and mentally well. And if they're not, they will be executed. And Danielle is in the room when this discussion is happening and Danielle does not react at all. So uh, something uh, unusual is going on with regards to the three laws of robotics. Well, could it be that uh, Danielle, um, there was no immediate threat to any particular child? Possibly, but in, in other scenes, robots seem to be distressed at the very concept of hearing about uh, even hypothetical threats to humans. Yeah, it, it's, it's a constant plot point that the positronic brain freezes up a little bit anytime it kind of confronts a circumstance where it can't follow the laws properly. Mm -hmm. um, Asimov messes with the laws a little bit here and there uh, in the story, Run, I think it's Runaround. Yeah. One of the robots is built with a modified first law that simply says, will not harm humans and takes out the, or allow humans to be harmed. Um, so he was aware immediately that this is stuff he could tinker with. Uh, I think there might be a sort of a first, a first law of fiction. Uh, every, any law that a writer comes up with uh, can be bent for the purpose of telling a better story, even if it's inconsistent. It, I think that story was either Little Lost Robot or Lost Robot. Um, Runaround was where oh, right. the, Runaround, Runaround was where a robot was going into danger at the order of and kept um, going in circles. Yeah, because he yeah. couldn't because the the immediate threat to him or to it was uh was outweighed by the rather loose order to go there. So yes. he was he was stuck in um what we would Limbo. call a loop. Yeah, Asimov created these laws. I I think that. To a large degree, even though he talks about wanting to address the concept of people's comfort with technology, that he also just built them in a way that allowed him to create puzzle stories. And I think, you know, sometimes he cheated a little bit in order to make the puzzle story work better. I mean, this is a man who once said when he learned that something he'd written about Mercury was scientifically inaccurate, he said, I'm not going to let science ruin a good story. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I just recently reread the short story collection, I, Robot, and most of those, you know, even though they start off with, here's the foundation, pardon the pun, uh, of the three <laughs> laws, um, most of the stories are about, you know, li like Little Lost Robot, where, where things are happening, where the laws are, are, either, are either conflicting with each other or, or because of maybe something a human has said or something inter inherently wrong with the robot, one of the laws is getting is getting violated in in some form or, or other, you know. So um, it was like he came up with the idea of the three laws, and then immediately set up set about to find ways to try to contradict them for these stories, you know. So I thought that was kind of humorous. Well, yeah. Asimov anticipated what we see in computer programming, where the computer does what we say and not what we mean. Yeah, he he was coming up with a consistent set of laws for robots, but he was also addressing the fact that people are inconsistent and yeah. you know we create we create laws rules and then we don't necessarily follow him it's not because we're opposed to the laws or rules it's just we're fallible i mean he kind of talks at the beginning of uh, i robot susan calvin talks about how robots are essentially better than people because robots will follow the rules they're given and people will be people yeah no. i i don't know if it was asimov or someone else who said that the three laws can apply to humanity as well. You know, you know, a human should never, you know, uh, harm another human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. We should obey lawful authority and we should preserve our own existence. Now that's, that can be argued and that's, a, that's for an entirely different panel. Right. That, that, that comes up in one of the last stories in iRobot, uh, the one with the politician, I think. Yeah. I also well, think politicians follow their own laws. I think it's really interesting to think about the stories as, um, um, and I'm not saying this is how they're, they're intended, but to think of them as debugging scenarios mm. where you basically think about how can we break these laws um, so that you know how to make them stronger 
uh, it's an interesting sort of angle to look at it from. Um, I did find a 1981, I think, quote by Asimov that claimed that he thought that these actual laws should be used with robots um, in the real world, which is interesting because I don't, I don't think that they, you know, from a, from a programming standpoint, the thing that's always stopped me is you can't really translate those laws into computer language very well. Um, I mean, you can create specific scenarios, but try, you, you can't like give a computer a sentence and have it obey the sentence. Right. I, I think it was, his statement there was really just an idealistic thought about the fact that he knew that robots would inevitably be used to harm people because any tool we've ever invented is inevitably used to harm people. Um, and I think he just thought of it as, you know, a safeguard, but also he probably just threw it out there as a discussion point. Uh, I've seen people discuss the idea of should robots have safeguards built into them. And, um, you know, I think people sitting around making uh, self-driving cars would love to find a way to put into something there that you mean, that means that no one can hack into the car and have it run someone over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's face it. Um, auto self-driving cars are probably the most, other than the ones used in the, used in, in the military, but um, as far as civilian use, uh, self-driving cars might be the most dangerous robot we have right now. Yeah. yeah. You know, interestingly, though, if everybody drove a self-driving car, tens of thousands of lives would be saved every year because we um, humans actually suck at driving cars um, because of a lot of factors like we don't mind speeding. We like that there are speeding laws and we like other people to get tickets. But of course, we want to be able to speed. And we're distracted by our other tech and so forth and, and the lunch and whatever, your latte. Um, we're terrible. We're terrible at driving. We need self-driving cars. They would, they would do so much good. I understand what you, you mean when you say that they're dangerous. And I think that they are. But I also think if I'm crossing the street, I'm probably safer. I am definitely safer with the self-driving car than with the idiot who's changing his radio station and, and drinking a beverage and whatever else at the same time. Yeah. And I think Possibly that's an underlying, we... go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Possibly I think that's an underlying. We... Go ahead, Alex. I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. I think that's an underlying theme of the robot stories is just robots can be programmed. People cannot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's the direction that the iRobot stories go into that by the end of that, of those stories, when the super brains are being built, super brains are like, they're going to guide humanity now because they can do a better job than fallible, flawed individuals, which I think is the theme that Asimov then starts to play with on and off over the years in his other works. Then we get to the end of the Foundation series and he's talking about uh, a universal hive mind, which was weird. Okay. That's one of the, th that's one of the back, uh, back themes of uh, Neil Asher's um, Polity series, in which the war between humanity and um, artificial intelligences were, was fought and won before humans even realized there was a war. And the AIs decided that we're a lot better at running things from a um, technical point of view. Humans are a lot better at the creative things. You know, so we're going to we're going to work, we're going to work the basics. We're going to work the mechanics. Um, you humans, go ahead and do what humans do. It's it's a fascinating series and a really interesting take on artificial intelligences and um, combined, you know, human and artificial intelligence. He calls them Haymans, but um, you know, so it's you know, there's there's a lot of books and you know, just throw that one out. Okay, what other authors other than Asimov have used the three, the three laws in their stories? Roger yes. McBride Allen uh, wrote a series of novels, uh, uh, I think called the Caliban series, about which explicitly were authorized to use the three laws and had, had characters building robots with variations of the three laws. And I've read the first one of them and I, I really enjoyed that. He, uh, uh, Alan looks at the various implications of how having a lot of robots around affects humans and and uh, some of the ethics of, of treating robots which are 
at least as intelligent as humans, as um, disposable servants. By the end of that series, uh, there's a new set of laws that are proposed that turn the robots from absolute slaves into, um, if not partners, much closer. And it takes away robots need to do things and replace them with, we'd like it, we're going to talk to the robots and have them cooperate with us. And it does, and it changes the first law to get rid of the inaction part, uh, which goes back to what Asimov was tinkering with early on. Uh, they're, they're generally successful in examining the laws, um, and I think they're reasonably entertaining books as well. Uh, I haven't read them in a long time, but they're definitely worth looking at. I, I see someone has commented that there's an, uh, a novel, Three Laws Lethal, by David Walton, which is about uh, the ethics and uh, practicalities of robot cars. Yeah, Williamson wrote a short story called "With Folded Hands," which oh, took okay. which took things to the extreme in their efforts to protect human humans and humanity. The robots wouldn't let humans do anything because doing something might hurt you. So, all, and it store and the story ended with all human all humans could do was sit in their room with folded hands and do nothing. Sounds familiar. Uh, turn oh, the yeah, on. these days, yes. <laughs> okay, um, other robots in fiction. Um, I'd like to start off with Ian Binder's um, Adam Link, who actually came, who in the story came up with a, um, with a, with a precursor to the laws, which a, a robot must not kill a human uh, must not kill a human of his own free will. You know, anyone else have any uh, fam famous robots in literature or movies or anything like that they want to discuss? I'm really fond of, uh, in particular, how they handled the holographic doctor in Star Trek Voyager. Um, there, there were, in particular, there was one where he wrote a novel that, that, um, was very successful, but because he was effectively the property of Starfleet and not an individual, they wouldn't let him make money from it. And that initiated a whole bunch of um, court activity. And of course, the similar things happened with data, but I think it was more complex with the, ro uh, with the holographic doctor who had been by that point so altered um, in his programming that he became something much different and much more than he initially was. He, his arc is actually one of the more fascinating arcs in the, in the series. And of course, the part at the very end of that one episode where you see all of the other holographic doctors who did not work out so well as doctors in there, aren't they working in like an asteroid mine or something like that? Really grim work. Um, passing this, around the novel. Pardon? And passing around copies of the novel. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. I, I do think that 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 sort of aspect of star of uh, pardon me of sci-fi where humanity gets its first sort of glimpse of these are some real issues that we're going to deal with in the future are really valuable and really interesting. Um, I I personally think that we need actual laws um, to help us cope with robots before they show up like real robots in the sense that uh that that um, many of us hoped we would have by now oh okay. uh, you've mentioned star trek one of my favorite um episodes of star trek the original series is i mud which is a planet of except for harry harry mud a planet of nothing but human-like robots mm -hmm. and where and where that where that uh where that took things. And James, I forget the details now, but James Blish had a wonderful sequel to that in, um, in a book that he wrote um, about Harry Mudd. It was, the t it was the novelization of the two Harry Mudd episodes plus the strict story that he wrote that basically took the, the robots of the, you know, Mudd's planet to an, uh, uh, an extreme. I would come back to data for a second. Uh, we're told pretty much from the beginning that he has a positronic brain. So even though 
there's nothing in Asimov books that tell us how a positronic brain would work. It was a shout out to the concept. And we know that with data, he sometimes seemed to act, if not according to three laws, he certainly had limitations on what he was willing to do in certain circumstances. He kills as part of Starfleet. I mean, he's going to sit in the ship and push the button and fire the phasers. But there was one episode where it was called into doubt whether or not he was going to kill someone to save his own life. And we're told in one of the movies he has a quote-unquote ethics subroutine, um, which I don't know if that means he was programmed by his creator with an ethics subroutine that no human being would have, or it's just simply the android equivalent of he was taught ethics. Um, they don't mean on the on Star Trek card, I don't want to go into details because people might not have seen it yet, but there are a lot more androids there, but they don't really talk about concepts like this at all. It's not really part of the show, which maybe down the line they'll get back to. Uh, but they talked about, you know, they played with it sometimes with data, but they were very inconsistent. That was not their chief objective was to talk about data's ethics. Anyone else want to want, want, want to talk about their, their favorite robots? Um, Robbie the robot from Forbidden Planet. Um, any of the, the droids in Star Wars? I mean, I don't think you know, they might be, um, first of all, it's a galaxy a long time ago. So um, it's, they, pro you know, Asimov probably wasn't even born then, but, um, you know. How, how about Bender Bending Rodriguez? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think, I don't think any laws were built into Bender. <laughs> no. The absolute and complete rejection of all conflicts. I'd be willing to believe that C-3PO has got programming that prevents him from shooting, uh, hurting humans or anything like that. R2-D2, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, an astromech droid, you are, you are working on a machine that is specifically to, to kill people and blow up things, you know, the, the X-wings, the, the various fighters. And, yeah. uh, that, you know, so I would think that that might cause a conflict if you've, if you've got the first law programmed into you. Um, but, but, you know, C-3PO, I mean, He's always, he's very timid, so I wouldn't expect him to, uh, I wouldn't expect him to do that. And really, 3PO as a character, as much loved as he is, really doesn't have much in the way of agency. Um, you know, he's not driving events. Events are driving him, and, and other characters are driving him. So, you know, he's not going to be the one to really do anything. Even when we saw him with a blaster shooting at people, that was because he had the... Um, the uh, clone army robot body. And so it was kind of doing its own thing according to its programming and then right. well, just reacting. But to it. Maybe he had the stormtrooper training, which means he could fire a blaster as much as he wanted. He knew he wasn't going to hit anything. <laughs> so now we're saying C-3PO is like the Navy SEAL that's so deadly that he can kill you with just lifting a finger, but he keeps himself in such firm control so he won't kill everybody he sees. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, um, at, toward, um, what was it? Actually, it was the last movie I saw in a theater before this whole mess started, um, Rise of Skywalker. Um, C-3PO actually allowed himself to be essentially killed in order to retrieve in, 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 um, in, in, um, important data. Sorry Dude, for the spoiler alert. Yeah. Sorry. I think but I think we could probably make a case for, for you know, how, how much did he really uh, allow it? You know, I kind of feel like that was going to happen no matter what, and he just acquiesced because, you know, his his masters... The droids do what they're told to, and then when they don't do what they're told to, you can put the little slave thing on them and uh, the really take away the autonomy. They sure. they are, you know, there's various levels of do what I'm told, that do what you're told, with the partial exception of R2, who seems to be like this one droid that has complete existence and that's probably because it seems like no one ever wipes his memory which yeah. is another weird it's like the, the star wars your standard star wars droid is supposed to only work so long before you go in and erase their their very essence okay instead of um, having laws you have just breaks men right. mention of the word autonomy reminds me of uh, the anna newitz uh, novel autonomous which deals with um autonomy in robots and in, in, in humans uh, in a, a variety of ways. The, the robots there have the, are, are generally um, required to be obedient, but have the, have the 
option if they live long enough and are, are fortunate enough to uh, to gain control of their own actions. Much like the, uh, the slaves in Rome, after you know, after a period of serving, they were you know eventually free to become citizens, usually at the death of their of their master. I mean, when you think about it, getting back to the three laws. Um, <laughs> A phrase from the Matrix, they're really a system of control to make sure that a sentient or semi-sentient robot, you know, is it becomes part of a, you know, a pliable and safe workforce for humans. So, so which brings us to the, the main topic I'm sure a lot of people are talking about, uh, the morality of taking, of programming sentient beings um, to, uh, you know, with, with these three laws, does that, you know, that sort of creates an involuntary, a state of involuntary servitude. That whatever the, you know, the being thinks or wants to do is limited by, you know, we are limiting him or, sorry, limiting it to, um, to um, what we want it to do. You know, of course, um, that's also known as child rearing. <laughs> um, and and you can say, well, of course, children have the ability to go against their programming, and that's true. But I always think of, I mean, you can you can think about religion. Most of the time, if you're raised religious, you're going to be religious, and if you're not, you aren't, with with obvious exceptions. But um, you know, the the McDonald's guy um, whose name I'm, I'm blanking on, Ray Kroc, is that right? Oh, yeah. uh, Get them right. when they're children and they're yours for life. We we program the heck out of people. Um, I mean, I think the the one thing is people can choose to go against that programming, but really they don't often, or at least not in dramatic ways. I mean, we can all think of exceptions to that, but an awful lot of people stick with that. Program. Yeah, there's a big difference between people and machines, though. It's just simply that the process of programming a person is slow and unwieldy, and you get a ten year period during the programming where the synaptic uh, responses don't work the way you were hoping. And, mm -hmm. be, you know, we can't program our teenagers, which ultimately I think is for the good, but, you know, they're, the whole concept of teenage rebellion, over, overstated or not, is this thing that machines don't have at this point. The, the standard Asimovian robot tends to be what, you, what it is at the beginning with some exceptions. Yeah, it comes across certainly that our Daniel Oliva, Oliva evolves to some degree over the years, although he also lives a very, very long time. Um, he, he has a character arc to some degree, but at the same time, at least in the original books, he's the same character he was at the beginning and the end. In the end, when we're busy watching the human change, and he's just sort of there to be kind of like the guidepost. Don't you think real AI, if it has the ability to learn though, like you might wake up every morning and find that the, your AI has a whole new philosophy of life, that they, they just, you know, they decided to explore Hinduism last night and, you know, they've, they have a new ethical stance on life. I feel like that would be a potential and that would be interesting. There was, of all things, a sitcom that lasted about half a season in the 70s called Holmes and Yo-Yo. Ah, yeah. uh, it was a, a cop show with a robot cop, and in one episode, he tells us that he's Jewish for the day because he is trying different religions and he's programmed himself to be Jewish. <laughs> and I thought that you know, I, it stuck. It stuck with me for forty-five years just because it was such a weird thing to pop up in the sitcom. Uh, I've never seen any science fiction writer play with that specifically. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of books out there where robots get religion. There is actually one of the iRobot short stories where a robot forms a religion and decides it was made by the central computer because human beings are, are too flawed to have possibly made it. Hmm. But Asimov, I think, would never, ever have a robot decide to be Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, because Asimov was an atheist and kind of took offense to the fact that people were an atheist sometimes. Yeah, that, yeah. Asimov's story reason was excellent. The, um, the, the robot who has deduced logically that uh, he is, uh, that robots are, are the perfect form of being. Gazanai. Right. Thank you. Uh, David Brin has played with the idea that, that um, robots ought to be um, treated as, um, as a next generation that needs to be educated and not, 
not um, not explicitly programmed. So we'll have characters that are that are raising robots as uh, as as um, children who will eventually be adults. Okay. Um, reading the messages, um, apparently there is at least one person who remembers Holmes and Yo Yo. And a message from someone says, Daryl Scott says that the cop, that, that cop show was based on a Harlan Ellison story. So yeah. yeah. Anybody, know, anybody know what that story was? Uh, it's, it's in the comments. It was called Brillo. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember, remember that story, but I didn't necessarily uh, connect it with that. When I, when I think of Harlan Ellison and robots, I automatically skip to demon with a glass hand. Yeah. One of the things um, that somebody uh, mentioned obliquely in the comments was um, people often talk about the singularity, uh, the, the notion that you'll reach a point where you have truly sentient, independent AI, and that will result in the destruction of, of everything. You guys have thoughts on that? I, I, think, I think we have nervousness about about that as a, as a race, I, I think we see that in our in our entertainment, in our fiction, because really you, we have a couple of, of exceptions. We have Data, we've got Olivov, but the majority of our fiction dealing with androids or robots, either we've totally made them slaves or or some sort of serving creature, or we have Skynet and they're trying to kill us all. Um, you know, so so I, and I kind of see that as some sort of a um, uh, uh, you know, uh, species nervousness about, geez, if we create a life that can think on its own, just like we can and make its own decisions, what, you know, are we now out of date? Or, 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 or you know, what's going to happen to us? I'm, I'm remain skeptical that we're going to see that kind of AI. Because we're seeing what we're seeing built as AI right now, I seems to be designed entirely to sell me things. Yeah. Uh, it's like the it's it's still possible that computer technology is going to veer towards what science fiction refers to as AI, but it seems like as an industry, um, nobody is vested in creating true artificial intelligence. What they're in, what they're interested in creating is just more tools. It could happen by accident. It could still be a possibility, but. I think 20 years ago, no one thought we were going to see AI as this thing that's designed to do our jobs for us rather than think for us. And wasn't it, the, um, I might be wrong with the movie, but Colossus, the Forbin Project or something like that, where all the individual computers and a early version of the internet sort of combined to create one massive it artificial was, intelligence. Who the, decided US to, and, the US and Russia both built strategic computers and the two computers started to talk to each other and realized they better take over because these stupid humans were going to start World War III. Yeah, mm. Colossus and Guardian. Guardian was the Russian uh, computer and, 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 and Colossus was the American one and they, they <laughs> teamed up. Yeah, which again only shows that um, maybe, we should, maybe we should turn things over to the, turn certain things over to the AIs, one, sm one smart enough not to destroy the world. We have got to have some reasonable expectation, though, that um, it, it's like one of the problems with monarchy. Uh, I remember like a, a benevolent monarchy is really the best form of government, but then the, the monarch's child takes over or the monarch's child is evil or nuts or whatever. That's the problem with the AI to me, that you can, you can build an AI that is much better at we are than running the country today, but what happens down the line? Yeah. Um, and even if the AI doesn't change to do something bad so much, you get something like our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, which made sense in, a couple hundred years ago that technology has, has overrun um, that particular Bill of Rights in some aspects. And so the, the, you know, the AI in charge, it's, a, it, it's static. And so that's problematic. Okay. We're coming up to about uh, the last 10 minutes, so and we've got three questions. Let me, let me go over them. Um, we may have already talked about it. Uh, Baden, 
has asked, how would cyborgs fit into this model integrating robotic and biological components? It's still possible. Um, uh, if I, uh, I'll, I'll call up Robocop as an example. You know, so that was, that was a cyborg. Uh, he still had a human brain, but they had programmed limitations into him, not the three laws, but, but uh, he had limitations that he couldn't, he couldn't harm, uh, what was it, the, the company executives or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, the, we're, we're, it is sort of a variant of like three laws for a cop. Three yeah. things that we expect a police officer to do, and then this hidden fourth law, which, you know, certainly is as opposed to anything Asimov would ever want, but fit the movie perfectly, fit Verhoeven's cynical worldview perfectly, and made for a great ending. Because sometimes the whole reason to create laws like that is to create good story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone, there's no real name except SB, has asked, it seems that in the real world, the three laws have been rejected for usage in operational robots. Why? I, th I think that goes back to what Mariah was saying, uh, that, that it's hard to, we, we don't have computer languages that, that can take English sentences as, as orders or restrictions. Maybe we will at some point, but not yet. I think the positronic brain gave the robots, Asimov's robots, a certain level of sentience that we haven't, um, we haven't achieved yet. They'll, they were thinking machines, and so they had, the, they had the ability to reason, and so that's why they need the three laws to kind of perform, a, give a framework of what it should be. And yeah, we're not there yet. We're, 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 we're programming things like uh, when, you, when you get close to a red light, what do you do? You apply the brakes. You know? So it's, it's that kind of procedural kind of thing that we're, I think we're still at, at this phase. We're not to the point where we're trying to program ethics. Okay. All right, and then anyone else on that one? All right, uh, from Leilani. Leilani asks, consider the culture novels where all intelligence is treated equally, are equally artificial or not, embodied or not, are these post three law novels? And one of them goes back to the Neil Asher um, books, quality books where intelligence is intelligence and there's really no restriction on what they can, on what they can do. Some are good, some are evil, either, whether or not you're organic or, um, or uh, otherwise. I think that that um, it's one of those things like they do in um, Star Trek where there's no poverty anymore. It, it's a really nice notion, but I don't see how that works with the way humans function. Um, you, you, it's especially visible in our culture right now that everybody wants to believe they're better than somebody else, uh, some other group of people. Um, so I don't know. I don't see that being very functional. I think that that's not even post three laws. It's, it's sort of post human. We have yeah. to evolve into something else to get there. Um, and then one last question, and we still have some time if anybody wants to throw in some questions. Um, robots with sentience could presumably program themselves. Is there a need for a law to prevent robots from reprogramming themselves or allowing others to reprogram them with a goal of eliminating any of the three laws? Well, we know that um, in, in, Lost, in Little Lost Robot, you can adjust the law in Asimov. So is there a need to, um, is a law to prevent robots from reprogramming themselves? I'm, I'm sitting here staring at the first law, and um, I think that might be a loophole, you know, because it says a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. There's really nothing there that says you can perform a totally safe action that will give you the ability to ignore this law. So, yeah, yeah I think that's a bit of a loophole there. Yeah, that, that, was, the, yeah. that was the thrust of a Little Lost Robot because they had taken out that second clause, allow, hum, you know, allow a human to come to harm, with the robot creating a situation where you know, a human could be injured but knew that he was, it was fast enough to prevent this. But once the action was in, once the situation was in, in effect, the robot could then ignore it because he could allow, it could allow a, um, 
a uh, a human to come to harm. Right. That was the one with the modified first law, right? Right. That's, yeah. Asimov in, in The Naked Sun also talked about um, the other loophole in the first law, which is robots can do things that harm humans as long as they don't realize that's what they're doing. Right. Okay. We are, we've hit the, we've hit the uh, according to my computer, we've hit the five minute mark. So uh, let's do a once around, uh, starting with Mariah. Um, work, you know, uh, what, what, what plans do you have for the rest of the weekend as far as Balkacon and where can we find your books? Oh my, your well, I am, I am free in five minutes. I have fulfilled my four panel obligation, uh, which is very exciting, but, um, all of the panels will be recorded. Uh, so if you're a writer, the ones I've done have mostly been writery. So check those out. Um, you can find all my stuff, including stuff about writing and, um, I think I might have written about the robot laws, in fact, on mariahcrawford.com. And I'm just going to say one quick thing, which is that it's entirely possible to have some aspects of programming of an operating system of whatever be protected. The only thing I will point out is that obviously you get an update to your um, operating system and things go haywire. And, and that's that happens with every device ever. So, yeah, there we go. Okay, uh, Keith. Anything else you want, anything you want to last minute yeah. messages? So as I said, I'm a science fiction writer. I've got this series, Time Hunt. This is the second book in the series. Third book should be out sometime in the next six to nine months. Uh, I, I, I uh, describe it as um, the fugitive meets back to the future. Um, I've also got a, uh, do a, uh, a quasi daily podcast and you can find all of that information. Oh, this by the way is, uh, my books are, are available exclusively on, Amazon in paper and ebook, and they're also on Kindle Unlimited. And then you can find information about everything that I do. Um, subscribe to my newsletter uh, at my website, uh, penslinger.com. I am also on Twitter as, as uh, Ed Gizmo and on Facebook as well. Okay, uh, Alex? Okay, well, I'm afraid I don't have any books. My lifelong dream did not come true. Uh, I will be back at one o'clock for a panel about governance in science fiction. And if the panel goes in a decent direction, I'm going to come back to Asimov uh, and talk about some of what he did in Foundation, uh, short form democracy. What's democracy? Um, I'm going to pop over into the Discord channel as soon as we're done, if people want to discuss this further for a little while, so I have to go to that panel. Um, I don't have a huge internet presence, but uh, if you are interested in silk, uh, on the 4th of, July, 4th of July weekend, I'm helping to run a virtual silk convention called Any Silk uh, that will borrow many of the forms we've been seeing over this weekend, assuming that we can get Zoom to cooperate with us. Uh, Andrew, uh, I'm sorry. Th this is my uh, last panel for the convention. I hope to be watching a few of the last, a few of the other ones as an observer, like the uh, governance one. Um, since this panel and my other talks will be available on, um, on YouTube, I hope anyone who is interested has a chance to go back and see my, um, uh, my talk, which was on Friday, um, two explanations, the ones that explain that erase history and the ones that don't. And I, I want to thank all the other panelists for a great panel. Thank you. Okay. Um, you, you can find my books on amazon.com or Barnes and Noble. But I would appreciate it if you went to the publisher's page. That would be Adwolf Publishing and Bold Venture Press. Um, and these days, small presses need your support. So um, I would like to thank all the panelists for a really good, really good uh, discussion of the three laws. And um, I would like to thank everyone else who took the time to come in and listen to us. And we still have maybe a minute or two before we get, before we are played off. Um, so um, anyone else have any comments? Thanks for coming. Yep. And thanks very much to the, the tech staff. Oh, it's definitely. Really fantastic. Yes. Thank you, Loretta, for helping us out. This Absolutely. has been an awesome thank, time for a virtual. And thank you for all the people. I'm looking at where the, we have people chatting uh, from as far away as Israel on the West Coast people who would never be able to come to Balticon otherwise. So there are some advantages to going virtual. Yep. Yes. Um.